Thank you, Geneva, for that lovely intro. And everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, I do not need to introduce my presentation because Geneva already went over the, the learning objectives. So let's just jump right into it. How is testosterone made? It comes from cholesterol. The pituitary, um, starting here, releases luteinizing hormone that stimulates the latex cells in the testes to produce testosterone. And testosterone supports many aspects of men's health, including muscle bulk, bulk and strength, bone density, mood, sexuality, uh, low levels, which are common in aging men can increase the vulnerability to bone fractures. But on the other hand, excessive dosing of testosterone supplementation can lead to polycythemia, which means your blood is too viscous. And testosterone um, affects the brain. It can sharpen thinking, regulate mood and libido, supports confidence and energy. It can also help burn fat more efficiently and declining levels of testosterone can lead to more body fat accumulation. Um, testosterone also has an impact on heart health and we'll go more into that later. And similar to the menopausal transition, men also experience hormonal changes with age. They see a decline in testosterone and other androgens after age 30. And this graph is showing you that testosterone starts declining earlier, but the decline is more gradual compared to um, how women's hormones change. The estrogen decline is much steeper. And it's called, and this time in a men's life is called andropause. And from age 30, their testosterone is going down about 1.5% per year. And the bioavailable portion of testosterone is declining more steeply at 2 to 3% per year. And this is a time when professional athletes start to have injuries from which they can't fully recover. And contributing factors to these hormonal changes include sex hormone binding globulin going up, luteinizing hormone going down, and then also decreasing activity of the latex cells. And the prevalence of low testosterone uh, is a little bit debatable depending on where you put the cutoff. I believe the current, the current standard cutoff for low T is 300 uh, nanograms per deciliter. Um, so depending on which study you're looking at, the prevalence is anywhere between 12 and 39% of men over 40 having low testosterone. And this is from the Baltimore study from the prior slide. It included this uh, pretty neat graph showing you that um, here's the prevalence of low testosterone based on decade. The total testosterone is the black bars and then the gray bars are free testosterone. So you can see that the proportion of men with low free testosterone levels is going up more steeply than those with low total testosterone. And that's because of the increased sex hormone binding globulin and because of metabolic syndrome. Testosterone is fat soluble, so it needs a carrier protein to be able to travel in serum, which is water-based. And only 2% of your testosterone is free testosterone. The rest is bound to sex hormone binding globulin or albumin. And only the free portion of testosterone is biologically active and able to bind to receptors. And sex hormone binding globulin has a strong affinity for testosterone. It can bind other hormones, but it prefers testosterone. And as this binding globulin increases with age, then the amount of free testosterone is going down. So why does it increase with age? And the main culprit is the enzyme aromatase, which irreversibly converts testosterone to estradiol. And over time, this pushes down testosterone levels and pushes up estradiol levels. And then estradiol itself drives up the production of sex hormone binding globulin. And since that prefers to bind to testosterone, that's leaving less available to um, act on the tissues. And this can encourage more body fat gain. And in the body fat, there's a high level of aromatase activity. So to interrupt this cycle, a common approach would be to directly increase the testosterone. And by the way, estradiol suppresses gonadotropin releasing hormone, and that will reduce pituitary secretion of luteinizing hormone, lessening testosterone output. 
And that's the problem with body fat accumulation with age. More aromatization of testosterone to estradiol in the adipose tissue results in less testosterone output. So there's both a problem with testosterone converting to estradiol as well as less testosterone production in the first place. And these additional factors contribute to de declining testosterone levels, poor diet, environmental exposures, medications, stress, illness. Um, and then also think about cyclists who suffer repeated microtrauma to the testicles. This can lead to decreased testosterone production in men. And there are some ways to help them. They can try a bike with a no-nose saddle. They can stand on the pedals every few minutes, or they can try recumbent bicycling, which these two guys are enjoying. And as for what are the signs of low testosterone, most people would think of erectile dysfunction and low libido. But hormone decline in men also presents with lack of motivation, lower muscle mass, reduced mental ag agility, night sweats even, and then feeling burnt out. Beyond these bothersome symptoms, low testosterone has some serious sequelae, and it can lead to some of these really serious uh, chronic health conditions, diabetes, osteoporosis, depression, hypertension, and even cardiovascular disease. And a meta-analysis of 12 studies concluded that low testosterone has been linked to increased mortality and increased risk of cardiovascular-related death, whether the low T is actually a cause or rather if it's a result of lifestyle factors that both lead to low T and also lead to cardiovascular risk has yet to be determined. But it is good to know what your testosterone level is because it is a marker of risk. In 2021, there was a small retrospective cohort study that found that low testosterone in male COVID-19 patients was associated with critical illness. And there was another study in 2022 in Mexico that found that low testosterone levels in men were an independent risk factor for mot mortality in COVID-19 patients. And males who required mechanical ventilation had significantly lower testosterone levels than those who did not. So low T can affect men's survival. This is how low testosterone leads to insulin resistance. There are kind of multiple cycles going on. It increases the adipose tissue formation and adipose tissue is more insulin resistant. Adipose can also produce leptin and leptin may reduce the production of testosterone. And then obesity causes a reduction in luteinizing hormone leading to lower testosterone production. Replacing testosterone to achieve a normal range can improve, improve body composition, and it can also revert insulin resistance, as well as all of these other benefits listed here. In 2008, there was an epidemiologic study that looked at the relationship between erectile dysfunction, metabolic syndrome, and cardiovascular disease. Patients with erectile dysfunction can be considered lucky because those are the ones that are motivated to seek out treatment, and that could lead to the discovery of metabolic syndrome or cardiovascular disease, and the treatment of those could save their life. Low testosterone often presents with excess belly fat, and that's often part of a condition called metabolic syndrome, which involves central adiposity plus two of these factors here. So elevated glucose, elevated triglycerides, low HDL, and hypertension. Low testosterone definitely contributes to metabolic syndrome, but it's not included in the criteria at this time. But maybe it will be at some point. Metabolic syndrome increases the risk of serious health conditions like stroke, heart attack, and type 2 diabetes. And besides the treatments, metformin and insulin, glucose control can also be improved by supplementing testosterone. And this has actually been used as a treatment in Europe since 1939 as a treatment for metabolic syndrome. And in fact, it's been shown that Testosterone works better for improving facilitated transport of glucose and nutrients than any available prescription drug. 
Osteoporosis is another problem that we need to address in our mature male patients. Up to one in four men over age 50 will break a bone because of osteoporosis. And by age 65, men are losing bone mass at the same rate as women. Testosterone replacement can help prevent or slow bone loss in men. Low T is also linked to depression. And replacing testosterone in hypogonadal men significantly improves cognitive function, depression, quality of life, as well as improving the well-known signs of low T, including low libido or erectile dysfunction. And falling testosterone levels are really only part of the picture. During andropause, estrogen, adrenal and thyroid hormones, as well as neurotransmitter levels can change too. And these all dramatically impact health and quality of life. A thorough workup would include screening for all of these changes in your male patients. All men produce small amounts of estrogen and progesterone, and the increasing aromatization with age leads to estrogen dominance in men. And this is a term coined by the late Dr. John Lee, meaning the influence of estrogen overshadows that of other hormones. And I know this picture is kind of funny. I think it's from 1991, um, but it's just showing that men can have higher testosterone levels than women of their same age. Prostate cells are influenced by hormones like estrogen, and estrogen has proliferative effects, promoting cell growth in size and number. And so estrogen dominance contributes to prostate enlargement involving symptoms like reduced urine flow, urgency, and frequency, and it may make men more vulnerable to developing prostate cancer. Progesterone receptors are in the pituitary, the hypothalamus, the testes, male mammary tissue, and the prostate. In males, progesterone is important for a number of reasons. It promotes the health of the cardiovascular and nervous systems and the brain. It's osteoblastic, promoting bone density. It does that for women too. And progesterone helps mitigate the proliferative effects of estrogen, and that's really important for prostate health. In fact, Dr. John Lee wrote that there are case reports of progesterone supplementation leading to improvement of benign prostatic hyperplasia. And here I'm summing up the research on the effects of progesterone on prostate health. Um, the progesterone receptors in the stroma cells inhibit cell proliferation, suppressing the development of BPH. The progesterone receptors also may prevent differentiation of prostate stromal cells into cancer-associated fibroblasts. The receptors inhibit secretion of IL-6 and um, stromal-derived factor 1, which are tumor-promoting cytokines. And these findings suggest a role of stromal progesterone receptors as a potential target in the prevention and treatment of prostate cancer. And prostate cancer is the leading cause of cancer in males. One in eight will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in, the, in their lifetime. It's second to um, lung cancer. And it's the second leading cause of cancer deaths in men. I'm sorry, lung cancer is the second leading cause um, of cancer in males. So talking about John Lee again, um, he researched the benefits of testosterone in men, specifically in relation to prostate health. Um, he wrote that progesterone and testosterone activate the projector protector gene P53, and that prevents the proliferation of prostate cancer cells in vitro. Progesterone also inhibits 5-alpha reductase, preventing the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. DHT stimulates proliferation of prostate cells. And according to Dr. John Lee, estrogen dominance activates the oncogene BCL2, and it's among the metabolic imbalances that can contribute to the development of prostate cancer. And Dr. Lee stated that optimal project protection against estradiol induced cancer occurs when the saliva progesterone level is 200 to 300 times that of the saliva estradiol level. So that's um, what the progesterone to estradiol ratio is based on. And what can be done? You can test hormones in saliva and then treat the imbalances that you find. The salivary comprehensive hormone panel is a great test for men, and that will reveal whether he has low androgens, 
if there's estrogen dominance or even if there's HPA axis um, dysfunction. And we have a whole lecture dedicated to selecting the best medium and methodology for testing hormones. But here I'm summarizing the main points. Um, saliva represents um, bioavailable levels of hormones available to the tissues. It correlates more to the clinical presentation than serum or urine because it measures the active portion of hormones. It is clearly the best choice to monitor topical hormone therapy. It's painless, cost-effective, can be collected at home, and you can diagnose, treat, and monitor all with saliva testing. And for a holistic approach, meaning being thorough, consider testing salivary sex hormones and serum testing for thyroid, sex hormone binding globulin, PSA, lipids, hemoglobin A1C. This will help identify imbalances and drive your treatment approach. And if you want to assess hormone metabolism, conversion, and detoxification, you can look at urinary metabolite testing. Our version of this test is called the HUMAP. Geneva mentioned that in the intro, it includes over 50 analytes. And this is just the androgen's neighborhood of the test. And this can be particularly helpful to look at the activity of the aromatase uh, enzyme, which I circled here, that's CYP19A1 here and here going into the estrogen section in that direction. And then you can also look at the activity of 5-alpha reductase, which makes DHT. And we've already talked extensively about aromatase, but as for 5-alpha reductase, too much activity can result in high DHT, which can be associated with pathological prostate growth, scalp hair loss, and adult acne. And there are many lifestyle changes, herbs, and supplements that could influence these important enzymes. Common strategies from these lists would be balancing blood sugar, minimizing alcohol, taking zinc, nettle root, saw palmetto, and pygium. So those are common supplements given to men to balance these out. Physiological testosterone replacement for men will achieve many physical and mental benefits with minimal side effects. Testosterone doesn't just help erectile function, it also improves body composition. It promotes stronger bones, more muscle, less fat, and it can help treat insulin resistance and depression. So that sounds like a slam dunk, but what about the risks? What does the literature say about prostate cancer and cardiovascular disease? For years, doctors were taught that high testosterone caused rapid prostate cancer growth and low testosterone protects the prostate. And giving testosterone is like feeding a hungry tumor. So where did this idea come from? This all started with a study published in 1941 claiming that testosterone was the cause of prostate cancer. Dr. Morgan Taylor, who's a neurologist at Harvard, reviewed the study from 1941, and he discovered that the conclusion was based on a case study of only one patient who received testosterone for 14 days, and he published his findings in 2006 and later wrote this book here, Testosterone for Life, and he continued reviewing the research, and in 2008, he concluded that testosterone therapy does not increase prostate volume or PSA in healthy men. And here's a retrospective analysis of 77 men with low T and normal PSA. And the conclusion was that high prevalence of biopsy detectable prostate cancer was identified in men with low or to low total or free testosterone levels despite normal PSA levels and digital rectal examination. PSA levels may be altered by naturally occurring reductions in serum androgen levels. Uh, these men had an overall decrease in prostate volume and in PSA levels. So testosterone might be therapeutic in cases of BPH. Unfortunately, there was no control group in this study and more research is needed. Normal testosterone levels benefit the prostate. Um, here's a trial with 207 men who had low testosterone levels and they also had sexual or urinary dysfunction. They were given physiologic doses of testosterone, and over 90% of them saw symptomatic improvement, and most participants had um, reduced PSA scores following the therapy. Here's another um, study, a systematic review. It found that if someone with metabolic syndrome develops prostate cancer, the tumors tended to be more aggressive, and recurrence after treatment was more likely. Um, so I wonder what does increase prostate cancer risk? There was an analysis from the REDUCE study involving men with high PSA scores, and they found that having an elevated total or HDL 
not a typo, cholesterol was connected with increased prostate cancer risk. So it is important to keep an eye on lipids. These are the non-modifiable risk factors for prostate cancer that we're already probably aware of. Being over age 65, certain um, race, and race and ethnic backgrounds matter, family history, and genetic variants as well. Regular early screening will become more important for people with these factors, but besides early detection, there are also preventive measures that they may be able to take to lower the risk. A few of the risk factors listed by the Knight Cancer Institute in um, Oregon includes diet, obesity, and having an STI. Maintaining normal weight and safe sexual practices are important uh, preventive measures. And I combed the research and found that obesity may increase the likelihood of high-grade prostate cancer. Um, IGF-1 is also likely to be involved as it's been known to inhibit apoptosis and stimulate cell proliferation. And you can possibly lower IGF-1 by avoiding high protein diets, um, high glycemic index diet and dairy consumption. To conclude this section, a 2016 meta-analysis found that prostate cancer appears to be unrelated to endogenous testosterone levels. Testosterone replacement therapy for symptomatic hypogonadism doesn't appear to increase PSA and it doesn't increase the risk of prostate cancer development. We need more studies with longer follow-up and I believe those are in the works. The question of whether it's safe to prescribe testosterone after prostate cancer um, has been diagnosed is really hard to answer and I don't have an answer for it. Um, and so until more definitive data becomes available, clinicians who want to treat their hypogonadal patients who have localized prostate cancer with TRT should inform them that there's a lack of evidence regarding the safety of long-term treatment for the risk of prostate cancer progression. So uh, there's kind of no conclusion there at this time. Now we're gonna talk about the controversy involving testosterone and its supposed risk uh, to the cardiovascular system. Um, so this all came from a 2013 study published in JAMA that the Journal of American Medical Association. And they said that testosterone supplementation increased the risk of cardiovascular events. And there were a lot of problems with this study, but this study made uh, big headlines and everybody uh, just kind of latched onto it. And so after therapy, the men tested had an average testosterone level of 332, which is still somewhat low. And many of them did not even have follow-up labs. Hematocrit wasn't measured and it wasn't an RCT. So it was di difficult to establish causation in this study. And the study was really flawed the, to begin with, but it also had two official corrections, one for misreporting its results. So it actually showed an approximately 50% lower absolute rate of adverse cardiovascular events in men who received a testosterone prescription compared with untreated men. So the conclusion that they published was wrong. And they also had large data errors, including that nearly 10% of their all-male database were female. Similar issues happened with this other study by Finkel. And, and others, and they claimed that they found an increased cardiovascular risk with testosterone therapy, specifically increased risk of heart attack in men over 65 who were on testosterone. There was no control group in this study, so they really couldn't report whether the cardiovascular events differed between treated and untreated men. And also testosterone levels were not monitored before and after therapy. And it's also helpful to know that in the US, the average age of the first heart attack for men is 65. So they basically took a group of men who were more likely than other men to have a heart attack, gave them testosterone, blamed the increase in heart attacks on the testosterone, but had no uh, control group. There were many refuting articles, but those did not really make the headlines. This was a study in the Journal of the American Heart Association in 2013. Testosterone replacement in men with hypogonadism improves obesity, type 2 diabetes, MI risk, exercise capacity, and QT length. 
And there was a large retrospective um, National Institute of Health study. They found physiologic doses of injectable testosterone were protective against heart attack in men with high risk. Another study in 2014, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, concluded that men with testosterone levels in the mid to upper range had reduced cardiovascular events and mortality compared to those in the low or high range. Numerous other studies support the cardiovascular benefits of testosterone or the lack of cardiovascular risk with using testosterone therapy. A 2018 article entitled RCTs, Mechanistic Studies of Testosterone and the Cardiovascular System, concluded that no RCT where testosterone has been replaced to the normal healthy range has reported a significant benefit or adverse effect on major adverse cardiovascular events, nor has any recent meta-analysis. Testosterone therapy does have side effects. Testosterone stimulates erythropoiesis to increase red blood cells, and that can lead to increased hemoglobin and hematocrit. These need to be monitored before and during treatment. About one in 10 men can develop polycythemia, and this side effect, along with the controversial research, prompted warning labels on all testosterone products, and that is supposed to include the possible increased risk of heart attacks and strokes in patients taking testosterone. And the two main references the FDA cites to support this risk are the Vigan and Finkel studies that I just showed you were um, highly flawed. And it's still really important to take precautions when utilizing testosterone therapy, um, monitor pre and post treatment levels, keep an eye on hematocrit, for example, but I wouldn't want this bogus research cited by the FDA to cause such a fear of testosterone supplementation that men who could benefit might miss out. For optimal results, testosterone replacement should mimic the physiologic free testosterone levels of a man in a sexual prime between ages 25 and 35. And it's generally accepted that this is when the most optimal levels of testosterone occur. In their 20s and 30s, uh, young healthy men make about six to eight milligrams of testosterone per day, which doesn't sound like a lot, but in most cases it's enough. And there are many modes of delivery to choose from when prescribing testosterone. Um, I would just caution against the older oral forms because those have been found to be liver toxic. Um, peak testosterone levels occur in the morning, so timing a topical sublingual or nasal prescription in the morning could be best. These two slides have a comparison chart so you can see standard dosing regimens for the various testosterone formulations available. Um, injectable or nasal sprays are a really good option if there's a pregnant female in the household or children. And I'll talk more about that in a couple of slides. For patients who wanna minimize appointments, insertable pellets that are replaced every three months could be a good choice for them. The only downside is that you kind of only get one chance to get the dose right, and then you have to wait three months if you want to adjust it. So here are just some diagrams of how um, inserting those pellets looks like, and then also how to find the location for intramuscular injections. Um, when you're doing an intramuscular injection, you need to avoid hitting the superior gluteal arteries and the sciatic nerve. And between injections, alternate the site between the left and right buttock. And this is the diagram showing you how the auto injector or sub Q, I don't know how to pronounce it, Ziosted starts with an X. Um, this is how patients can do that at home. You twist off the cap, squeeze the abdominal injection site to create a raised area. And then you place the needle at a 90 degree angle to the abdomen, push down for 10 seconds after you hear a click and then the viewing window is gonna turn orange to confirm the dose was administered. So that is the downside of sub-Q injections that the needle's very thin, and so it takes a long time to deliver the dose. So that can be a little uncomfortable. Um, 
Also, you might think about um, customizing your testosterone prescriptions, and you might want to include chrysin because that can act as an aromatase inhibitor preventing testosterone to estradiol conversion. Um, progesterone is also another thing you can add to uh, protect the prostate. Progesterone can inhibit aromatase to some extent. It also has mild 5-alpha reduction reductase inhibition effects. And you can find pre-made creams that don't require a prescription that contain progesterone and chrysin. If you are doing um, oral dosing of chrysin, uh, the standard doses would be somewhere around 160 milligrams twice a day, um, up to a total of 400 milligrams per day. And if you leave today with only one, um, one take home point, I just want to stress, consider the lowest dose you need to achieve clinical response. And I consider 20 milligrams of topical testosterone to be a maximum dose to remain within physiologic ranges. And that's really the minimum you can achieve with Androgel, the 1.62% version, and it goes up from there. So just want to show you that a lot of people end up on pretty high doses of androgen, Androgel, and that that gel can get into a lot of places. Um, achieving adequate testosterone levels can improve men's health, but too much, too high of a dose can have serious consequences and be outright unsafe. Uh, be aware of your patient's fertility preferences because supplementing testosterone can decrease sperm production, and I'll explain how and how to address that concern in a little bit. Exogenous testosterone suppresses natural testosterone production even in physiologic doses, and without enough intratesticular testosterone, sperm production won't occur. Both endogenous and exogenous testosterone directly inhibits gonadotropin-releasing hormone and luteinizing hormone, and that leads to a downregulation of testosterone production. So there's a negative feedback loop happening. Most research suggests it takes three months of TRT to suppress spermatogenesis and impact fertility. And according to the World Health Organization, azospermia rates caused by testosterone are between 64 to 75%. So it should be avoided in males desiring fertility. And the big question is, can spermatogenesis recover after stopping long-term testosterone therapy? And it can, but it can take anywhere from six months up to two years, according to data from this research. Um, there are potential alternatives to testosterone replacement when preserving fertility is a concern. In younger males, HCG is the preferred treatment for hypogonadism to try to preserve fertility. And testosterone should not be used in, um, in younger men unless there's Leydig cell failure. HCG needs functioning Leydig cells to work. You have to measure luteinizing hormone and FSH. And then if the LH levels are, let's see, if they're less than three, usually HCG will work between three and five um, variable results. And then five or more, HCG might not work. And that's when you might consider um, testosterone therapy. Also, HCG doesn't work as well as a monotherapy if baseline testosterone levels are below 300. And here are some guidelines for dosing. A common way to dose HCG is 1,000 units three times per week. Um, antibodies can develop with chronic use. So most protocols will give HCG for two months on, one month off, or six weeks on, two weeks off. Um, and then the total free and bioavailable testosterone will usually increase by about 25% and symptoms should be improving. Some physicians will combine HCG and testosterone together to try to preserve spermatogenesis. And research indicates this can be a really successful strategy, but advise the patient there is no guarantee that spermatogenesis will be preserved. You can just kind of do your best to try to prevent that effect. Um, here are some side effects of HCG and contraindications. Um, don't use HCG in patients with prostate cancer. 
Um, some common side effects might be acne, um, nausea, stomach pain. Another non-hormonal option that will avoid testosterone suppression is Clomid. It's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It's not FDA approved for use in males and doesn't work in men over 55. It inhibits negative feedback on the hypothalamus and increases luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, and it can boost testosterone without affecting fertility. When testosterone levels are really low, it can take longer to see the benefits of Clomid versus testosterone replacement, which is a lot faster, and older men may not respond as well as younger men. Um, here are some clomiphene uh, side effects, gynecomastia, latex cell tumor, pulmonary embolism, um, that one is more rare. Back to TRT. Um, Besides fertility, you also want to think about how testosterone therapy might affect others in the household. Um, transference to women and children in the household is a recognized uh, risk. And this is a worst case scenario here. There was a pair of twin girls exposed uh, to their father's testosterone gel, both um, in the womb and after they were born. And this caused clitoromegaly and pubic hair growth in these babies. And they also had testosterone levels that were, did not return to normal until they moved to a new house after age three. And there are many uh, cases like this that have been documented. So that's why precautions are important. Um, apply creams or gels directly to the application site, wash hands with hot soapy water afterwards. Any surfaces that come in contact with testosterone should be wiped down. Um, with hot soapy water and linens, sheets, towels can also be a source of exposure. So anyone using testosterone should be putting their own laundry into the washer and not let someone else handle the, um, the dirty laundry. Once treatment has started, um, this is how you should monitor it. Um, you look at salivary testosterone. You also wanna know about estradiol and progesterone, PSA, uh, consider a DRE and then monitor hemoglobin and hematocrit. Also take a look at glucose and hemoglobin A1C, at least at baseline. So you would repeat these once in the first three to six months and then annually. And for pellets, injections, or topical patches, you should usually test midway between doses. And for topical creams or gels, if you're testing saliva hormones, test 12 to 24 hours after the last dose. Nutrition and exercise are really important to maintaining health during andropause and also when treating hypogonadism. And lifestyle interventions that can help testosterone and slow andropause and prevent metabolic syndrome, um, are these are really important. Herbal and hormone therapy can also be helpful. Um, so this is the... Um, strategy of lifestyle support. Think about stress, sleep, exercise, nutrition, um, socializing, and uh, hydrating. And we can't avoid stress, but chronic stress can lower testosterone levels. Um, so men should care for their nervous systems in order to modify their response to stress and reduce its toll. Uh, mindfulness meditation can be helpful, regularly utilizing deep breathing techniques and maybe forest bathing, just meaning going for a walk in the woods once a week, every two weeks, something like that, if you have access to a nice space like that. Exercise. Uh, regardless of the form, can boost testosterone levels, although resistance training does tend to have the best um, effects. Uh, but it's important to choose an exercise form that your patient enjoys or at least is willing to do and can make a habit of it. Here are some nutritional um, components that can help support uh, androgens and can help um, treat insulin resistance. So think about low glycemic index, eating healthy fats, branched chain amino acids, especially when combined with exercise can be really helpful. And make sure the diet contains whole foods, less processed foods, more fiber and antioxidants. DHEA is the precursor to testosterone. 
Um, 25 milligrams can support neuroendocrine function. 50 milligrams can help bring up testosterone levels, but make sure you test DHEA, testosterone, and estradiol levels with therapy. It can convert all the way there. Zinc is really important for prostate health. It supports the pituitary's production of testosterone, and then it suppresses aromatase. It improves sperm count, motility, and morphology, which are important for male fertility. And a good source in food is oysters. Tribulus terrestris can improve free testosterone and also erectile function. And the mechanism involves supporting the nitric oxide pathway and also increasing intracavernous pressure. Horny goat weed. Uh, was named so because um, shepherds saw their goats um, being more sexually active after eating this plant. And it increases testosterone production and also possibly enhances erections by calcium channel blockade and mild PDE5 inhibition, um, similar to medications. And so it, it has a similar mechanism of action to uh, Viagra. saw palmetto has 5-alpha reductase inhibition activity, preventing the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. It's been shown to be as effective as finasteride without the loss of libido, but since it's an herb, it hasn't been as well studied. Um, typical doses might be 160 milligrams or 200 milligrams. Nettle root can displace testosterone from sex hormone binding globulin and also can inhibit aromatase and 300 milligrams is a common dose for that. Uh, velvet bean contains L-dopa, it's also called macuna. So it has the precursor to dopamine and dopamine enhances testosterone secretion. Um, I found a study that showed using macuna improved testosterone, luteinizing hormone, dopamine, um, and other measures in men with infertility. It reduces, it reduces follicle stimulating hormone and prolactin and sperm count and motility were significantly recovered in these men after treatment. Uh, shilajit is a sticky substance that is found in the Himalayas. There's a long history in Ayurveda using this as an anti-aging compound. Um, in this trial of men between age 45 and 55, uh, shilajit increased total testosterone, free testosterone, and DHEAS compared with placebo. And also luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone levels were maintained. So there were no adverse effects on fertility. Here is a sample treatment protocol. You might think about 10 milligrams of testosterone topically along with 10 milligrams of P4 means progesterone along with 50 milligrams of chrysin. And the men would apply one milliliter behind the knees every day. Uh, zinc at 30, I believe that's supposed to be 30 micrograms every day. DHEA at 10 milligrams, some rhodiola, B-complex, more fiber in the diet, and 20 minutes of weight-bearing exercise three times a week. The goal would be 30 minutes five times a week, but you gotta start somewhere. Here's what I hope you will remember from the presentation. I'm not gonna read these all, but um, make sure you check your testosterone levels in men with metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, and insulin resistance. Low T is not associated with cardiovascular, or low T is associated with cardiovascular disease. It's It hasn't been proven as a causative factor to that, that testosterone supplementation increases the risk is what I'm trying to say. Um, men can become estrogen dominant. It's not just a condition for women. Um, and this happens with increasing age, promoting BPH and progesterone can protect against the influences of estradiol. The benefits of treating low testosterone, in my opinion, um, substantially outweigh the risks. And here's a little diagram of all the benefits. And that is the end of the presentation. Um, hopefully you're all still with me and I'm ready to take your questions. <laughs>